Hello everyone and welcome to How to Make Working Parenthood Work and Be Yourself in the Process. My name is Rebecca Luber and I'm the Director of Career and Business Engagement with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our members and donors of the Alumni Association for powering our alumni webinar series. If you're interested in learning more about the Alumni Association, you may visit umnalumni.org forward slash membership. All right, we have several other webinars coming up, including our Return to Travel webinar series, which continues next Wednesday, where our travel director will host a conversation with one of our tour providers to discuss how travel is moving forward, as well as a preview of, ex of our exciting destinations for 2022. The travel series features a different tour provider each week from now through June. To learn more, you may visit umn.org slash virtual. Today we're using Zoom meeting, uh, Zoom webinar platform. You have the option of also listening in by phone by dialing 646-558-8658 and then entering our webinar ID, which is 933-0106-3818. Today we'll reserve about 15 minutes towards the end of our conversation for Q&A questions um, from, from the audience. And you may drop those questions into the Q&A box which is located on your participant panel bar. All right, and without further ado, I'd like to begin introducing our, our featured presenter. Daisy Dowling. Dowling is, is founder and CEO of WorkParent, a specialty coaching and consulting firm that provides advice and solutions to working parents and organizations that employ them. Her clients include Dow Jones, KKR, Paul Weiss, Edward Jones, Big Lots, and the United States Air Force. She created the first ever column on working parenthood for the Harvard Business Review and is author of Work Parent, The Complete Guide to Succeeding on the Job, Staying True to Yourself, and Raising Happy Kids. Daisy is also a proud full-time working mother to two young children. Thank you and welcome, Daisy. Rebecca, thank you very, very much for having me here today. I'm particularly delighted to be with this group because while I am not a graduate of the University of Minnesota and I don't have a formal affiliation with a school with a university, I consider myself to be a product of it. In 1929, my grandmother met my grandfather at a sorority fraternity mixer when they were both undergraduate students at the schools of engineering and education. Um, if that had not happened, and if not for your wonderful institution, I would not be with you here today. So it is really wonderful to be part of this team. A warm welcome, welcome to everybody on what is a very cold and rainy day, at least here in New York City. And I'm excited to join you to talk about how you can become a more successful and satisfied working parent. Now, over the past year plus, 14 months, going on 15 months throughout this pandemic, those of us who are working while raising children and maybe working and also going to school while raising children and raising children who may be in school whose school is not in session and we've been distancing learning them. We've all been grappling with what in normal times in regular course of business is a big challenge and it has become an unprecedented challenge. We've been gone from having two full-time jobs to three to four to more. It's been overwhelming. It has for you and it has for me as well. I have two children, they're seven and nine. They distance learned for 13 months. I'm happy to say this is their first week back in in-person school. If you see this nice bookcase behind me, it's because I spent a lot of time figuring out where in my small New York City apartment I could angle the camera for today's session so that you wouldn't see the huge piles of laundry that I haven't gotten around to and probably won't get around till this weekend or next. We're all in this challenge together and we're all experiencing these pressures. So this session is about real and it's about acknowledging that problem. At the same time, we're not gonna spend time on that problem. We're not gonna focus on it. As your executive coach, as your working parent coach, I'm here not to help you think about what's hard or what's difficult, what's not working, but to push you forward, to gently nudge you towards different actions, habits, and techniques that can ensure your success and satisfaction as a working parent. 
Now, to be clear, I don't have a magic wand that I can wave and make some of these challenges that you might be facing go away. You don't have it either. None of us do. That's not real. That's not realistic. But what I can do is help move you forward to take some important next steps that will make it more able, that will make you more able to bring together those all important spheres of your life, the parenting and the professional, to merge them, to put them together in the right way, right meaning what's right for you, and to find greater confidence as you do that, to find greater solid ground to stand on as you go through that process. In order to do that, I'm going to share with you seven key strategies that whatever your field, your function, your particular role, whether you're in school part-time, full-time, or just working, if you're not in school, you're an alum, um, whatever your career ambitions are, whatever your family structure is, your phase of parenting, whatever the details, whatever your personal circumstances that you can use to become and to stay more top of game, to do that over time, to do that sustainably. Now, these are strategies that come from two places. First, from my 15 plus years as an executive coach, working with men and women, moms and dads who wanna figure out how to achieve, how to succeed, how to live, fulfill their ambitions and live the life they want. Very importantly, these also come from the hundreds of conversations that I've had with working mothers and fathers in all different fields, in all different phases of parenting, with all different beliefs and backgrounds in different parts of the country and in different parts of the world. And I've asked each and every one of those men and women, what advice would you have for another working parent? What allows you to bring together those two spheres in your own life? What do you wish you had known when you started out working parenthood? What works? What works for you and might work for other people? And over time, I have taken the best kernels of advice that I've heard, and I've taken the themes that I've heard from one conversation to the next and boiled them out down and distilled them all down into much of what I'm going to share with you today. Now, the good news is, as busy working moms and dads, very busy with a lot on your plate, that I'm going to share this advice really quickly. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker. I tend to talk really fast. And for the next 30, 35 minutes or so, I'm going to be doing the talking. All you need to do is sit back in a course of a very busy day with a million things going on. All you need to do is sit back and listen to take in what I'm sharing with you and to, to listen for yourself all these different new techniques, tips, approaches to things. While all you're doing is listening, at the same time though, your role here is a very active one in two ways. First, as you do that listening, as you kind of let this wash over you, I want you to be thinking actively for yourself. What of what she's saying am I maybe doing already so that you can gain confidence and a sense of reassurance that you're already on a good path in those ways? Also, what will you hear? What are you hearing that either you might be doing, but not quite enough, or you could be doing in a slightly different way or a technique that's new to you entirely that you do want to use, that you do think could be powerful in the context of your day-to-day -day professional and parenting life. Now, if you have particular questions as I'm going or reactions or pushback even, I want you to get in there in the Q&A and throw your voice in. Every single one of us has questions, concerns, ideas, specific strategies that have worked for us that maybe I won't even touch on. The richer that we can make the conversation that we have at the back end of my comments, the better. And if you have a question, a concern, a comment in your head, don't be shy about bringing it forward because I can guarantee you that most, if not all of the other working parents in this session do as well. Now, I said I wanted you to listen and to think, I'm, you know, here's a technique she just mentioned I can commit to. Here's a new thing. I haven't thought about it this way. On the back end of this hour, well, all you have to do is listen. On the back end of this hour, I want you to leave with a few things. Those new ideas with a greater sense of confidence and competence as a working parent to feel that you are back in the driver's seat again, rather than working parenthood being something to endure or something that is happening to you, that you are something that is that you are controlling it. And importantly, I want you to leave with a plan. 
with two or three, maybe they're small, but two or three specific things that when you hang up on this call, on this Zoom, that you're going to be, you're going to start doing right away. Without further ado, let's turn to these seven strategies. And we're going to start big, big picture, and we're going to funnel down really quickly to the super tactical. Number one, and if I leave you with absolutely nothing else over the course of this entire conversation, I'd love to leave you with this. Number one, understand your working parent template. Your working parent template is the collage-like collection of different experiences you've had with, bits of advice you've gotten about, and different you know, sort of experiences, lived, real pieces of advice you've gotten in, different things you've picked up about working parenthood over the course of your life, the observations you've had of it, the experience you've lived, all of it, starting from when you were very young. Those pieces of experience, of observation, of advice, of hearsay, have come together over the course of your life in ways you may realize, but in ways you may not realize or have paid as much conscious attention to. They have come together to form a pretty solid picture, a collage-like picture for you of what you think working parenthood and good working parents, what that means, who they are, and what they do. Let's take a specific example. Let's say when you were growing up, your mom worked full time but was able to leave work at five o'clock, completely leave work behind, drive home, make dinner for you and your siblings. And then you all sat down around the kitchen table and ate dinner together most nights. If that's the case, you may have someplace in the back of your mind that really good working parents are good at drawing firm distinctions between work and not work, that they can leave work at five o'clock. Or you may have it in your mind that really devoted working parents, the kind your mom was, cook for their ch children or eat dinner with their family every night. Let's say your dad worked three jobs when you were growing up to you know, just keep food on a table. And those three jobs were hard and he was constantly working and long shifts and weekends or overnights. And he never seemed to really complain. He was an incredibly strong guy. Well, you may have internalized the idea that working parents should just be able to toughen up and do it, or that working parenthood is just about your own resilience. Or let's flash forward. Let's say now maybe you're in a social media group and all the other moms and dads in the social media group are talking a lot about how they've benefited from part-time arrangements, particularly after they had their second child. Well, each of those different experiences, each of those different bits and pieces are real. They're valid, and most importantly, they're yours. But if you spend your time as a working parent with that template, controlling or influencing your thoughts, your actions, and your feelings now as a working mom or dad, that's going to be a very difficult place to be, particularly now during the pandemic. Let's say that you've been working double shifts because you're in healthcare throughout the past 14 months and you haven't cooked dinner for your family hardly that entire time. Well, if you spend your time thinking back to mom and how she cooked dinner when you were growing up, or you think to the social media group about how people are talking about flex time arrangements and that's not an option for you, you're going to either feel a little bit cheated or like you've let your kids down or you're not doing what you quote unquote should be doing. Now, each of those different experiences is an example. Your template is unique and it's gonna be completely specific to you. But the goal here and the first thing you need to do as a working parent before thinking about any of the brass tacks techniques that we'll cover in just a few minutes is to understand that template so that you can control it rather than it controlling you. Don't go through working parenthood and particularly not working parenthood right now, dragging this thing behind you, this set of impressions behind you like a heavy bag of rocks. Put it down and understand what you want your own deliberate working parent template to be. So here's an assignment, and I'm going to give you a lot of assignments. You can do them or not do them. This is entirely up to you, but an assignment. The next time you get 20, 30 minutes free, which I realize is not easy for any of us as working parents, but maybe this weekend, you can carve out a little bit of time while the baby is napping, the kids are in the backyard, grab a blank sheet of paper. You can do this exercise by yourself, with a friend, with a partner, however you choose. 
And I want you to jot down the different bits and pieces that you think have gone into your template. That can be your parents' example. It can be you know bits and pieces you picked up through your education, through your friendship groups, through early career experiences, through your professional training, from mentors, from colleagues, from media and social media, how you've seen working parenthood portrayed in a movie you saw, whatever it is, jot that down so that you can understand what's in your template. And then I want you to take that piece of paper and just put it down on the table and step away for a second. And think to yourself, how well do all of those bits and pieces of my template map to where I am now? Maybe my you know, friends in the Facebook group, maybe they are living lives that allow them to approach working parenthood in this specific way, but that doesn't map to my own experience. Or maybe you know, it was okay for you know, growing up for my parents to have approached working parenthood in a certain way, but you know what? They could draw those boundaries because they didn't have to be working parents with smartphones and the 24 seven pressures on all of us that modern technology has created. You're not giving yourself a pass or a buy, but you're understanding all your impressions so that you can free yourself from the pressures they may be putting onto you. And you're getting real about the kind of working parent that you can be and that you wanna be right here in the day today. That's number one. Number two, I want you to start drawing and drawing stronger boundaries between the different spheres of your life. For many years, all of us have been encouraged to strive for this ideal of quote unquote work-life integration. And it's a really great phrase. I love the idea and I'm kind of with it too. The idea that you're one person, you're not two people and that the two parts of your lives can sort of blend together. I get that and that's important, but here's the thing. In the past years and as a very, very busy person and now throughout the course of this pandemic, we have all gotten to the point where any boundaries or delineation that we had between the different spheres of our life, parenting, professional, personal, maybe educational also, where those things have completely blurred together. We've lost the distinctions entirely and that is crushing us. If you think back to a typical day throughout the pandemic and you remember you know, you're waking up really early in the morning not going to bed until late at night and during that 16 hours or 18 hours or however long it was how much you were spending your time trying to do two things at once trying to oversee your kids homework while you were also keeping an eye on your messages coming in from work maybe trying to study for a final if you are in school trying to study for a final while you were in your workplace or during a break at work you're trying to do many many different things at once and part of that is good there's some efficiency to it but here's the thing, if you feel like you are being torn in multiple directions all at once, you will not feel as on top of things or as in control. And ultimately nobody but nobody wants 50% or less than 50% of you, not your kids, not your colleagues, not your boss, not your clients, nobody. So I want you to think however small in whatever limited or non-limited way you can do this, to start drawing distinctions and boundaries that allow you to show up as a professional, as a parent in other roles that you may have in your life, but to show up most fully and to focus as much as you can in that role while you are doing it in the moment. Now, what can some of those boundaries look like? Well, a lot of us may be working from home right now and we don't have some of the natural boundaries we used to, like on your commute, maybe you used to listen to podcasts or to music and that was sort of your transition space and then you would show up at work and be in professional mode. Maybe you don't have that anymore, but maybe you can walk around the block a couple of times before it's time to sit down at work and start performing and producing. Maybe if you have a home office, you can deliberately and consciously close the door whenever it is time for you to get on that work call or to, you know, to work on the document that you need to for the office. And in that way, allow yourself to be fully focused and present, to bring your best professional self, to be in performance mode, even if it's only going to be 20 minutes until your kids need you again. Maybe you have to draw more sort of subtle or psychological distinctions. So a home office, I live in a New York City apartment. Nobody has their own home office. The housing space that we live in just doesn't allow. So if that's the case, 
You may think about different, or if you have very young children, you've got to keep an eye on them all the time. You may think about different boundaries. Maybe you think of yourself as being in work mode when you're, if you're working at home, when you put on a pair of shoes or a jacket. Or maybe you start trying to create time delineations and boundaries where you say, after a certain time in the evening, even if the messages are still flooding in, even if my mind is still on what happened on shift, I'm gonna have a deliberate off time and I'll imagine myself pressing the off switch, like on a treadmill, pressing the off switch so that I can completely transition and pivot into being the parent I want. Release one side and focus on the other. Now, I have one client who actually keeps a family photo on her desk, and every time she flips back and forth between being parent and professional, she touches the photo as if she's touching a light switch, and it allows her to shift back and forth to completely release thoughts, worries, focus in one side, and to be more focused on the other. Now, I realize these boundaries are not perfect. They're not you know, maybe even natural ones. They, they may even be a little bit goofy, the boundaries that you decide to put in for yourself or that you can put in for yourself. But the more that you can draw that line and say, I'm in professional mode. I am in parenting mode. My job right now is to do this. It will allow you to feel more in control of your time. You won't be multitasking as much and crazy. You will be focused on what you are doing. You will allow yourself to do better at it because you will be focused and you will gain just a little bit back of that sense of control over these two demanding parts of your life. So get away from integration and think about appropriate boundaries where you can draw them. Again, even if it's only a few minutes here or there, or even if your boundary is just a line inside your own head. Those are two big picture pieces of advice. Understand where you're coming from and how that's influencing you as a working parent so that you can stake your own, put your own flag in the ground and be the working parent you wanna be. And think about drawing boundaries between those two. Those are big picture. But now let's move, let's pivot, and let's get really tactical. And the next three specific strategies, pieces of advice, actions I have for you, all speak to what I think of as your working parent operating system. Your operating system on your computer is all the sort of stuff that happens outside, you know, behind the screen in the guts of the computer, all the kind of software-y stuff that's working there so that you don't have to engage with it. It's the stuff that happens automatically. So on the front end, you can just focus on typing your Word document or using the keyboard, whatever. Just as your computer has an operating system, you yourself as a working parent have an operating system. It may already be a fairly good one, but all of us need to be thinking about, just as we do with our computers, with our technology, about patching and upgrading that system over time, making it as robust, as consistent, non-glitchy as possible so that we can do everything that we want to on the front end as we look at the screen. So here are three strategies and tactics for doing that, which brings me to number three, which is to build your village. Now, it's an old, old saying that it takes a village to raise a child. I think we've all heard that one. And Hillary Clinton wrote a book to, with that title maybe 25, 30 years ago. It's an old, old book. It's been around. We've all heard this. What they don't tell you when you become a working parent, first of all, is that it takes a pretty large, robust strong, active, well-planned village to raise your child because you have so much going on. And they also don't tell you when you become a working parent that you are the mayor of that village at all times, from the day your child comes home to the day your child leaves home. And that you need to be thinking about consistently how to build it out, how to plan it, how to add in the new structures and elements that you need to. Because when you brought your baby home from the you know, adoption or you know, from, the, from the hospital, from delivery, you didn't just find all the villagers sitting around your living room, like a ton of people saying, hey, we're your team, we're here to help. So here's a tool for thinking about how to build your village, about how to get more of the help and the support that you need as a professional, as a parent, and also as a person. Remember you, the human being right? The adult who's at the center of this all. The tool is what I call 8C. 8C is simply a way of looking thoroughly and holistically across all the different types of help and support you could get. Now, just to be clear, 
when you do this exercise, and I'm happy to, to have it posted on your website so that everybody can access it, access this worksheet, this tool afterwards. So you don't have to you know, scramble and write this all down. But as you do this exercise, Mary Poppins is not going to float in on her umbrella and land on, you know, in your front yard and suddenly be there to help and support you. What this will do, though, is help maximize in a holistic way the help and support that you can get to give you that little bit of extra lift as a working parent. In 8C, each of the C's is a different category or type of help and support that you can get. And the eight C's are this, career, colleagues, corporate or organizational, care, so paid or unpaid care you can get, computer or IT support, apps, systems, trackers, et cetera, clinical support, that's your, your own healthcare provider or a nutritionist or your child's pediatrician or the nurse practitioner at the pediatrician's office, all of the above. It's your couple. You may have a spouse, a life partner, you may not. You may have another co-parent, somebody who is in this with you together, whether or not they are your spouse or life partner. And then finally, your community, neighbors, friends, extended family, uh, members of your faith organization, if you're part of one. I want you to go through each and every one of those categories and to push yourself to think what small amounts of help you could go and find or ask for. Maybe you think, oh, your colleagues, yeah, a lot of them are also working parents, but they're overburdened. I don't know what kind of help and support I could really get from them. It's not like they're going to come over and babysit. Right now during the pandemic, probably not. But maybe the working parent who's just a couple more years down the road than you, or who recently got promoted or advanced in your organization, could give you some advice about how they did it or some tricks and techniques for talking effectively about their working parent responsibilities in a very demanding work environment. Maybe through a special app, you could streamline you know, the carpool process or throw some of your groceries on automatic reorder somehow and save yourself that 10 or 15 minutes of just organization and planning and entering stuff that you usually have to every week. Maybe within your broader community, you don't have a ton of people who live around you. Maybe the, you, know, you don't have grandparents who are willing to just drop in and may not be able to now, right, with COVID going on. But maybe your eight-year-old son who's been struggling a little bit with some of his math homework or at, you know, with math distance learning, maybe there's a, an extended relative, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, you know, a college age cousin, somebody who can beam in via Zoom or another app like this a couple of times per week or once a week for 20 minutes and help your son out with the math homework so that you're not always the one who's driving the homework thing forward, you're not always the nag, and you're not spending all of your time inside the third grade math curriculum. I have a third grader, I'm dealing with the third grade math curriculum right now, which is why that example comes top of mind for me. Now, as you go through all of this, you know, all of these different categories and you think about a pep talk you could get here, a practical support you could have there, a little bit of time you could win back there. Again, it won't be life changing, but what you will do is two things. You will gain yourself the this confidence and the sense of control from knowing that you have treated working parenthood just the way you would treat a work project, strategically, thoroughly, holistically, creatively. You will also find those bits and pieces of help, support, and advice that might just be able to get you through the rest of the pandemic in a better frame of mind or help you through the next really, really busy six weeks of work as we get ready for tax filing, extended tax filing season, or help you as you get to the end of your master's program when you're working and going to school at the same time. Whatever it is, it'll give you that little bit of relief. Number four. And in that same category of operating system and bit of relief, I want you to do a new assignment, a new technique, the calendar audit. When you have 15 minutes free, 10, 15 minutes, this is very quick, I promise, and some time to yourself, I want you to grab your last week's calendar, Google Calendar, Outlook, whatever it is, as well as your to-do list, your task list over the past week. And I want you to grab a red pen, real technological metaphoric, grab that red pen. And I want you to go over each of the things that were on your calendar, each of your commitments and each of your to-dos. 
And with a very critical eye, you're not beating yourself up. You're just kind of looking very, very carefully. I want you to circle or put an asterisk next to any of the specific things that you could have maybe delayed, deferred, delegated, said no to upfront, done in slightly less time, decided to outsource or you know automate in some way. You're not going to find an enormous number of things, right? You're not going to be able to win yourself 25% back of your time and say, oh, I'll just decline this. I'll tell my boss, no, that's not realistic. That's probably not going to happen. But as you go back over your past week's calendar and to-do list, I guarantee you that you will find a couple of small things that maybe you could have not done, that you could have relinquished, you could have pushed back on or won yourself a bit of time back. Much more importantly, what you will also begin to see are some themes. Maybe you're a little bit of a perfectionist and you tend to kind of hover over work, you know, processes or products or things that you're working on. And you tend to try and put lots of finishing touches on them before shipping them out the door. Or maybe you tend to say yes, just as a default to whenever somebody asks you something, whether that's you know, your child's teacher asking for you to volunteer something at the school, or whether that's your kids asking you for something. Maybe your kids are getting to be a little bit older now, and you've noticed that you're doing a lot of stuff that, gee, maybe your 11-year-old could be helping you out on. Whatever it is, when you, after you've circled all those things, take a step back. You're not criticizing yourself. You're just noticing those opportunities of time, and you're noticing those themes. Then I want you to immediately pivot, and I want you to give a good glance quick glance to your next week's calendar and your next week's to-do list. And with those themes, with those insights in mind, I want you to play it forward and to take the same red pen and circle just a couple of things that you can push back on, that you can ask for help with, that you can say no to. Maybe you only win yourself half an hour back. That half an hour is time that you can spend working on that really important work project you're behind on or reading to your child or exercising, that time matters. Maybe you can only get back 5% of your time and you think, well, gee, what is it really worth it? 5%, that's not gonna really change anything. 5% of your time is 12 full business days per year to be working on that next entrepreneurial opportunity, to be taking a vacation, or just relaxing week to week, a few hours here and there at a time. So do that calendar audit, get as much help as you can, and think about how in ways through help, through time management, you can just have a little bit less to do, less on your plate and feel more mo motivated as you go. Number five, I want you to start controlling the narrative. As a working parent, all of us are used to being in a little bit of an awkward mode when it comes to speaking about our parenting and professional responsibilities when we're in the other sphere. Think back over the past year or even since you've become a working parent and how you found yourself oftentimes a little bit on your back foot, feeling a little bit apologetic, like, oh, I'm so sorry, I need to leave now to take my child to the pediatrician. Or telling your child, I know, I'm so sorry, mommy or daddy doesn't want to go on the business trip or leave for you know, the hospital to do my shift, but I have to, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. I want you, instead of finding yourself trapped in that apology, not feel good, feel awkward. What are the words I should be using here? My intentions are good, but that's not coming across. I want you to get yourself out of that space and to a place that's more genuine, authentic, where you know what to say and where the story, the story about you committed as a professional and as a parent and doing the best you can, where that's the story that's coming out both for yourself and for others. Here's the tool that you're gonna to use to control that narrative. It's a four-sided frame consisting of your priorities, your next steps, your commitment, and your enthusiasm. The next time you're gonna to have to have or find yourself in an awkward conversation or explaining yourself as a parent in front of your colleagues or as you know, somebody who works in front of your kids when there's that awkward crossover, whatever the situation is, I want you to think about getting out there, being a little bit preemptive, being confident, not apologizing, but talking about your priorities, next steps, commitment, and enthusiasm. Here's what that looks like, just to give a specific example, if you're a parent who's just back from parental leave 
And let's say you're you know, rejoining work, you're rejoining your colleagues and like virtually every parent, male, female, no matter how long you've been on leave or how little leave you've had, you feel overwhelmed, kind of sad, a little bit tossed and turned just emotionally and practically by what's going on and what you're dealing with and the big transition. If you didn't feel that way, you wouldn't be human. I have yet to meet a working parent who didn't feel that to some degree, but you're, you come back and your colleagues say things like, oh, it's good to see you, or it's good to be back, or they don't say anything at all. And you want to send the right message, but you're also feeling crummy. You don't wanna lay all your cards out on the table and say, oh, I'm so sad to be here, or I feel conflicted to be here because that would send the wrong message, but you wanna be authentic in yourself. So priorities, next steps, commitment, enthusiasm. You go back in, and in some of the first few meetings or Zooms or conversations you have with colleagues, you say, this is my first day back or my third day back from parental leave. And my priority right now is to catch up on all the progress that was made on XYZ project while I was out, to clear up some of the emails and the messages that I have to clear up, to get into a good routine and make sure everything's working well at home. Next week, next month, I know that we have that big client meeting. And I'm really focused on getting ourselves and the team ready for that. And we'll be doing a first draft of the presentation actually before Thursday when we can all review it. But I'm looking forward to that. I think that client meeting is gonna go really well. Now, of course, I'm sad to be away from the baby. Who wouldn't be? But it's great to be back with all of you here and to see all of my colleagues. In that way, you have been authentic. You have brought forward things that are important about you as a person that you do miss the baby but you have conveyed the totality of your commitment and your professionalism to other people for whom that matters. So don't shy away from the story, not talk about working parenthood or find yourself apologizing the next time your child runs through the foreground of your Zoom, get ahead of it and talk about it using that four-sided frame. Number six, and we're gonna pivot here. We talked about big picture, about how you can think about and control yourself in the context of working parenthood. We talked about improving your operating system, making that work better, being ready to control your story and own that as a professional, which speaks to your and will help enhance your own professional brand. And can also help you talk about work responsibilities at home too. You can flip this around, that technique around and use it in the other direction. But now let's talk about the parenting part and how when you're working a gazillion hours every year, or if it feels like it, and you have very, very little time, precious time to connect with your child or children, how to make that time as connective, as valuable, and as satisfying to you and to your kids as it possibly can be. Now, I say that because when I talk to, when I interview hundreds of working parents, all of them report some version of the same which is that maybe you've had a long day in front of your laptop or you've had a long day you know, on the construction site you know, as an engineer focused on a building that's going up and you come home and you know that you're only gonna get 45 minutes between when you all gobble down dinner until your kids have to go to bed or homework has to start. You as somebody who is so committed to your children want that 45 minutes to go well and you want your kids to feel well, you know, loved and supported and so forth. But oftentimes that blows against you. You're tired, the kids are tired. You're rushing to different places. You're thinking about what you still have to do at work and all that kind of stuff. And you come home or you turn your attention towards your kids and you say, how was your day, sweetie? And you get a monosyllable back or nothing, whether your child is three or 13. You, it doesn't work out the way you want. Well, here's how to start conquering that. Enhance and make easier to bond with your kids. Enhance those bonds through ARR, activities, routine, and ritual. Your move to the hoop to date to work to bond with your kids has probably largely been through talking, through expressing interest and concern the way one adult would to another, asking questions about the school day, saying, you know, how did the test go, sweetie? Or, you know, what was it like? Or how was daycare and so forth? Or expecting your child to tell you stories or ask you questions to interact the way you normally would in a very satisfying adult relationship. Well, whether your child is three years old or 13 years old, here's the thing. They probably don't really yet have the capacity to do that. It's simply a developmental thing. They don't think about the totality of their day. 
if they don't summarize and draw out themes and want to share them back to you, they're just not capable and particularly not when they're tired. An older teenager may be capable of it and just may not be interested in doing it because they're a teen. So get around that and think about how to create immediate bonding instead of by talking, by doing an activity. When you come through the door, immediately get on the floor with your toddler and say, what should we play? And do whatever it is he or she wants. If you have an older child, instead of asking all kinds of questions about the school day, pick up the mitt or the ball, go immediately into the backyard, start kicking it around or doing whatever it is that your child wants to do. Talk will emerge and bonding will emerge organically from those activities. Then think about adding in routines and rituals, activities that are not just one off, but that are habitual. Things that your child can anticipate, that they know are coming, and that they will look forward to. That might be something as small as always singing the same song before you put them to bed. It might be always having, you know, breakfast of pancakes Saturday morning around the kitchen table. It might be always just watching a TV program together in the evening because you're all tired and you want to unwind. I don't care what it is but bake in as much routine and ritual as you possibly can. For an adult, doing the same thing over and over and over again can get really boring really fast. We all want variety, we want novelty, we want new. It's part of the reason the pandemic has been so hard on all of us. For a child, routine is reassuring, particularly for very young children. Routine is reassuring, it is comforting. Knowing that we're gonna have pancakes for breakfast every Saturday morning is something they can anchor to, they can relish, they can anticipate. If you look at any child's TV program, you'll notice that every single episode of the same program is incredibly formulaic. The theme song comes on at the same time. You know, the characters always wear the same costumes, etc. because the producers of those shows know that children love continuity. They love being able to anticipate. So it's not going to be perfect. Your toddler may still be cranky. Your teen may still be in a bad mood and slam the door. That's inevitable. It happens. But get away from talking from verbal interaction and think ARR to amp up the quality and the satisfyingness of that time that you do have with your children, however limited it is. Number seven, and this is our final technique before we go into conversation and back and forth ourselves. Number seven, learn to tame but not eliminate, just to tame difficult working parent feelings. And by those, I mean guilt and overwhelm most prominently. There are others too, but those are the two big ones. When I say tame or diffuse, I choose that word really carefully because here's the thing and your eyebrows are gonna go up and you're gonna say, oh, what? As soon as I say this, I don't want you to get rid of either guilt or overwhelm. You see a lot of headlines in the media about working parent stuff. And some of those headlines will say, oh, just ditch the working mom or working dad guilt. I don't want you to ditch it. Guilt and overwhelm are signs, they're signals that your head and your heart are in the right place. When you feel overwhelmed, it's because you're fully cognizant of the responsibilities that you have in both spheres of your life. You take those responsibilities really importantly, you take them seriously, and you intend to fulfill them. There are a lot of them, which is why you feel overwhelmed. Guilt is the byproduct of feeling like you've acted in a little bit in misalignment with your values. Like if you told your child you're a really good mom or dad, and you told your child that you would spend this evening with them, really focused on them, and then you have to take an important phone call from your boss because there's something blowing up at work, you'll feel guilty because you have to, you feel like you're not doing your good mom or dad job. Well, I don't want you to get rid of that guilt because you are a good mom or dad and there will be a little bit of friction between your two spheres. You will feel sometimes like you're favoring one at the expense of the other. It will happen. It's because you care so deeply about both. So realize that those feelings are normal, that they're an example, that they're evidence of the fact that you are doing the right things, you're focused on the right things, you're committed to the right things. But we're going to learn to diffuse and to tame them, to take a pin, to put them into the balloon of guilt and overwhelm, and to have that balloon deflate. Here's how. Three specific techniques. First, I want you to try restaking. Restaking is simply replanting your flag in really rocky emotional territory. In other words, reminding yourself that you're not acting in opposition to your values, you're acting in alignment to them. 
when you do have to take that important phone call from your boss and you do have to turn away from your child who you said you would spend the next hour or evening with, and you do feel the guilt begin to surge, instead of allowing it to take control over you and throwing all kinds of labels on yourself, I'm a terrible parent. I, you know, I broke my promise. I did all this. Instead of going there, I want you to remind yourself that yes, you didn't choose this, but that you are trying to act as best as you can in alignment with your values. Because I'm a loving on the job mom or dad, I promised my son that I would spend the evening with him. Because of an emergent phone call that came up from somebody very senior in my organization, from my boss, from a colleague, I had to direct my attention to work. That is work that I do to ensure the security and the safety of our family, to provide us and my children opportunity for the future, to save money for their college education, whatever it is. That's why I do this work because I'm a loving on the job mother and father. In other words, bring things around full circle and remind yourself of the bigger picture. The second technique is simply to push back on those feelings of guilt or of conflict by using one single word. That word is really? Pretend you're your own best friend and you're standing next to you, depersonalize it in a way. And as soon as you start throwing all those labels on yourself, I'm a terrible parent, I feel really guilty. I want you to pretend to take the other side and to say, really? Are you really a terrible mother or father? Do we need to get child protective services involved here because of what just happened that you took a phone call from your boss? Are you really not working as hard as you could or performing as well as you can, even though you worked nine hours yesterday and you did it while you were homeschooling your child during a pandemic? Is that really true? Are you really what, a lazy person? Is that really the case? And I want you to keep pushing back using that really in an almost sarcastic way. You'll find yourself maybe becoming a little bit indignant. Of course, you're not a terrible mother or father. You're killing yourself to be a great mom or dad and to be a great professional. You may also find yourself beginning to crack a smile or laughing because those statements are so that you've been putting on yourself are so obviously misguided. They're so obviously preposterous. You're doing your very best. This won't get rid of the guilt, it'll help bring it down. And then my very final technique, and this speaks to overwhelm instead of guilt, is to use what I call a done list. Every single one of us has a to-do list that's about 30 miles long. There's a gazillion items on it. No matter how hard we work, that list never seems to get any shorter. That's a recipe for overwhelm and exhaustion. Being on a treadmill that's going really fast that you can't jump off of and there's no stop button, you're gonna get ground down quickly if you haven't already. So here's how to upend that cycle and to feel motivation and forward momentum again. In addition to keeping a to-do list, all the things that you have to do in, your, you know, in the various areas of your life, I want you to keep a done list and you put things large and small on it. We finished this project on time and under budget. I threw in a load of laundry. I helped my eight-year-old son with his math homework. I um, had a good conversation with my teenage daughter yesterday. Uh, I snuggled with the baby. I had a difficult conversation with somebody at work, but we ended up getting to a good place. I was able to diffuse some workplace tensions. Whatever it is, you throw that on your done list. Post-it notes around your computer or better yet on your iPhone where you can you know, grab it out and look at it whenever you feel like looking at it when you're on the go. Whenever you feel your energy at an ebb, Whenever you feel a little bit depleted, I want you to look at your done list and immediately ground yourself back. Instead of a, I have so much to do on my back foot feeling, immediately ground yourself back in the reality, which is the unbelievable amount that you are doing, accomplishing and taking on board every single day as a professional, as a parent and in other areas of your life. And you will ground yourself back in a sense of the depth and totality of your commitment to those two different spheres. It will give you a sense of satisfaction, like a good performance review, as opposed to just reminding yourself constantly what I yet have to do. So keep that done list. Now I'm gonna stop, we have 11 minutes left. I'm gonna stop, my kind of talking portion of this session is over. But both you and I know that working parenthood is never or could ever possibly be completely managed or solved within the course of 35 or 40 minutes. 
in my book, I've gathered hundreds of different, much more specific, some of them, pieces of advice on everything from how to interview for a job as a working parent and the special techniques there while you're IWAP interviewing while a parent. But also things like, well, how do you get a healthful meal on the table after a long day when you're working incredibly hard and it's 7 p.m. and the kids are really hungry, what do you do? There's so much that goes into this. But we're going to stop here now. We're going to continue the conversation as a conversation. And we're also going to, I'm going to encourage you when we finish this conversation to keep on this conversation, to talk about what you've heard here today with other people in your life, with other working parents, you know, and to start getting their pieces of advice, their good recommendations, and to keep this going, to kind of keep the cycle going, to find what is going to work for you. So take some of these things on board, then add your own and go find out more. But with that, Rebecca, let's turn it back over to questions. Yes, thank you so much, Daisy. That was all great information. I wrote down a number of different strategies that you shared with us today. There is a question in the queue that is asking about managing unbalance between parents and family relationships. And so I'm also thinking that might be applicable to maybe those who um, don't have a partner at home to help them um, balance out some of the work and um, load of parenting and working. And so what might be some strategies that you want to share with our audience? Yeah, so this is a great question because it speaks to the wonderful diversity of working parents. And I can't help myself. I didn't share any numbers or statistics in this conversation, but I can't help myself in saying that there are 52 million American working parents, men and women who are working full time and have a child that they're responsible for at home who's under the age of 18. It goes without saying, but let's say it, say it here anyway, that those that group is incredibly broad and diverse and that 50% of that group is part of dual career couples. So they're trying to figure out how to make it work. Another 25% of that group is single parents. So we're all grappling with this working parent challenge in the context of a different family structure. Just quickly, here are a few things that I think are really important, regardless of what, um, you know, what your home life, what you were, um, you know, being an independent solo or single parent versus uh, primary breadwinner, et cetera. Here are a couple of things to know and to do. Um, I'll start here with dual career couples. If you are a dual career couple, I want you to get in a regularized bulletproof habit of once a week or more often if you choose, but minimum once a week, sitting down together to have a what's coming at us over the next week meeting going over not just the schedule and the calendar and sort of reciting what you need to do, but looking particularly at the areas of greatest stress and strain. The days that when one of you has a deadline, when one of you has to work a double shift, when school's letting out early, when your child has a test, when a regular caregiver can't come, whatever it is. So that together you can plan forward, the two of you, to thinking about how to cover the two of you have an enormous amount going on. That's difficult to handle as it is. It's even more difficult to handle and it tends to create a lot of friction between couples, between spouses or partners, co-parents of any kind. When in addition to having too much to do, you also find yourself in improvisation mode. Well, I thought you were doing pickup. Well, I have a deadline today and I can't do that. You need to do it. If you find yourself in that last minute back and forth, it usually leads to an argument or at least to some friction. That's what you can control and stay out of. So try to play things forward. As you do have those weekly meetings, also take care to start the conversation by looking back over the past week and saying one thing that worked really well so that you're grounding yourself in a sense of accomplishment. It was great that all three of us were able to get out to the park together, together on Saturday afternoon. It was a great break from the grind. Or I really appreciate how you were able to make dinner on Wednesday because it allowed me to stay you know, late or focus on work and get towards my deadline. Whatever it is, have some shout outs and a what worked and then look forward. If you are a single or solo parent, the name of the game here is going to be trying to find as much additional help resource as you can. I know that's extraordinarily difficult in the normal course and it's even more difficult now when we can't necessarily see our loved ones. When their you know, daycare or schools may be open, closed, some combination of the two or the situation is changing or in flux. 
I recommend you go back and you look over the 8C model. Again, this will be posted for you. You can use it. And to think about as much as you can about every type of help and support you can get. For the book, as I was writing it, I interviewed deliberately a lot of single and solo parents to get their advice and what works. And one thing stuck with me, and I include it in the book, but it's this great quote. One thing stuck with me, a single mom, widowed, two young children, one with special needs, who told me a lot, a big job, a lot going on, living in an expensive area, all of it, said to me, you know what? I have to ask for more help than I can get. If I'm not asking for help to a point where people say no to me, it means that I'm not asking for as much help as I could. If I hear yes every time, it means that there might be just a little bit more than I can get. I have to allow people very graciously to say no to me, but I always make the ask. Not a perfect solution. It's not going to solve everything. But again, go over and think between you know your community care, um, you know your um, extended family, colleagues, etc. What kinds of help, support, and advice can you possibly get? How can you maximize that village? Great. Then, if you are a sole breadwinner or a primary breadwinner within your family, I think it's really important to understand the role that each of you wants to play. If you're gonna be the primary breadwinner, okay, but you're not only your job. You wanna also think about those connective times that you're gonna have with each of your children or ways in which you might with your partner get some, you know, think through work situations or particular um, ways that, you know, you could be approaching your career. So it's just a ma matter of being very conscious about the type of setup arrangement family that you have at home and trying to do what's going to work there and be most sustainable over time. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here about what are your thoughts or advice uh, for the notions of work-life balance versus work-life work blend? I think you kind of touched on it, but I'm curious to know uh, more about your thoughts on that work-life blend piece. Yeah, so I, I'm going to I'm going to actually go long here. I love the question and we could debate this and it's um, I'm the daughter of an English teacher. So I can, you know, I can talk about wording all day long um, and I've just written a book. So I love thinking about words. Um, I'm, I'm going to go long here and I'm going to say, I actually don't really love any of these terms. Work-life balance means that both parts of your life have to be in perfect equilibrium at all times. I don't know about you, but I don't think I have ever felt like that. Work-life blend, I again, it's kind of like work-life integration. It's important, but I'm so blended at this point. I feel like I'm, you know, cooking on all different burners all the time, and it's really overwhelming to me. I prefer to think about this as work-life control. My work life may look very different than yours. It may be quite unbalanced. I may have much more than I can actually really do. But the important thing, the thing that's going to allow me to move forward with confidence, to feel capable, to feel like I'm in charge here of my life, to have that sense of, yes, I can do this, is feeling like I'm the one making the choices. So yeah, maybe it's only for 45 minutes this evening that I put my you know, computer away, that I don't check all my client emails coming in, that I don't respond to people. But I'm the one who decided that because I want to spend those 45 minutes with my kids. Then later, I'll get back online. I'm going to make that choice to do it. So it's about control and choice. That's just my, my own personal view, but I, I think it's the thing that gives me and it gives a lot of my clients to a greater sense of being, about, again, back in that driver's seat. Great. So we have about two minutes left, so not much time to really, or one minute left, so not much time to answer any, many more questions. Um, someone has asked, will we have some sort of slides or information that we can share out afterwards with participants or any like key points that we can share with folks? Yeah, so I'm happy to share just a summation of what I discussed here today, and that's all yours. Um, I'll send it to you. You can post it on the, you know, on the website or it can be distributed to participants afterwards. We've got the yes. email addresses. That's all great. So you'll have the, the cliff notes, the takeaway, as well as the 8C tool. But I wanna close out by playing this forward. I know I've just thrown a lot at you. You've got a lot going on and you think, gee, some of these techniques, tools, assignments, how am I gonna do this? I already feel a little bit overwhelmed. Just pick one or two, go narrow, test them out. Think of yourself as running an experiment here. But as you do that, I want you to think about your own child right now 
And then about he or she or them 25 years forward from now. 25 years from now, I really don't want there to be sessions like this. And you don't want your child to be feeling like working parenthood is such an overwhelming thing, a burden or so hard. We wanna normalize this. We wanna set great examples for our children and whatever we can do today, individually in our own lives and collectively as working parents to take a step forward, we're making it better for them, for the children we love. Thank you so much, Daisy. We appreciate all the advice and tips you provided us today. Um, I just want to note that I'll be sending out a, the recording of today's session along with the notes um, that um, we'll be um, providing to everyone who's registered um, for today's session within about two to three business days. And I'll also send out a survey for folks to provide your feedback and input on today's session, as well as for you to provide input on future topics that you like for us to cover in, um, as an alumni association. Thank you and have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you for having me. Yes, bye.